Hello, I'm David Lasso with a coin conversation. Rare coin investment and collecting is now popular with people from all walks of life. But it's not always been that way. There was a time when coins were collected by only a few. With me to share his recollections of the early days of numismatics is Mr. Abner Kreisberg. Mr. Kreisberg, thanks for being here. You're very welcome. Now, it's my pleasure. We, we told a story of when someone asked if you were a coin dealer and you said yes, and then they asked what you did for a living. Right. How far back do you go in numismatics? Uh, in I coins? started really in about 1938. And the story, I was in the refining business of precious metals. I had two friends. One was Abe Kossoff, who was a legend in numismatics. And the other one is a friend of mine whose name was Sidney Balaban. These two gentlemen were drafted at the same time. I was too old for the, the war, and they asked me to take over their business while they were gone. So I said, obviously, I can't do both. So we flipped the coin, and that's how I got in the coin business. And what was your interest in coins? What well, I was a collector of the double eagles, and uh, I also enjoyed collecting coin glass. I don't know if you've ever seen any. The 1892 but convention. 1892 and 93, yes. There was, and they were such exciting th things to me that I just collected those for a while. But then I found out that a coin, a coin dealer sh should not collect coins. But because I collected a few coins, a friend of mine came in from Akron, Ohio, a collector, and asked me for one of those coins which I had. He didn't have no idea I had it. I went and I pulled it out and gave it to him. Uh, if, you, if, if collectors and dealers find out that Abner Kreisberg is also a coin co collector, I'm going to say, well, he keeps everything that's good for himself. Right. So the, but I've since collected other things, like uh, paintings, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Right. You've been in location in the same place since 1948. Yes. Uh, no. I came out here in 48 from New York, I see. where we were at 42 East 50th Street, and uh, we moved here to uh, a corner building, and we were upstairs for about two years. Then we came down to Beverly Drive, and have been there ever since. You spoke of an association with Abe Kossoff. Abe Kossoff and I became partners in New York but, uh, on the story I just told you, because he and I were friends and he asked me to take over or join him while he was in the Army. And one of the most important numismatic organizations is the Professional Numismatist Guild. He, the PNG, yes. And I understand you and Mr. Kossoff and, and another Saul man. And Saul Kaplan. And Saul Kaplan. Yeah. What was involved in starting an organization like that? Well, it took a lot of time and study to face to make up the rules and regulations. And that was done, I think, primarily by Abe Kossoff and Saul Kaplan, who has had experience in that line. And I was one of the members that would help to start it. And that has grown now to be a very important organization in numismatics. What was the need for it? Why did it come about? Well, as in, in all businesses, you have people who are honest and people who aren't. It was our, it was the job of the PNG to only accept people who are known and have uh, had some auction sales or written articles and have a good reputation. And today uh, we have quite a roster and if you wanted to join you would have to fill out the application and meet all our requirements. You're also a member of some of the other major numismatic yeah, the, organizations. Of course, the old one is the ANA, American Numismatic Association. Their, uh, their main offices are now in, in Colorado. And then there's the American N Numismatic Society mm -hmm. in New York on 155th Street and Broadway. Quite an interesting place. I, I suggest if anyone is interested in numismatics, and they are in New York, to go up there and have a look. It'll be a revelation. Through the years, you've handled some of the most exciting coins, some of the rarest coins on the market. Yes. Who are some of the most exciting collectors that you know or knew? Well, at that time, we had quite a few. Uh, Fred Boyd, 
who was vice president of Union News Company. They had the stands and subways, you remember those? And the newsstands and the subways. Uh -huh. And he was a, a fantastic gentleman and collected coins, U.S. And uh, then there was Mr. Eliasberg, who was a banker in, in Baltimore. He was a collector and finally he managed to collect a complete collection of every coin that the United States has ever struck, including the, the colonials. And you had an interesting story and about how he got the last yes, two coins. Uh, uh, the uh, two coins which he needed to complete his entire collection, I had in the Adolf Manju sale in California in Beverly Hills uh, in about 1950. And, and uh, he came out here to buy the two last coins that he needed for his completion. And it was a dime, a dime and a half dollar. And uh, he did buy one coin, the half dollar, and the dime he did not buy because he felt that the price was going too high. He figured he would have another opportunity, which he did have at another date, and he, he completed his collection. This collection of his was then put into plastic and shown in all the banks around the United States. I think they're still on exhibit, as, as I recall. I know that task today would be virtually impossible to collect all the coins from the room. Well, it would be almost impossible to collect this again. Then there was King Farouk. You had actual dealings with the yes, king we of had Egypt. King, yes, we did. He gave us a carte blanche to buy every coin that was in the, uh, the pattern book. Uh, there was an A.W. Adams and Wooden. Adams was a, a collector. Wooden was the, uh, a member of, con of, uh, of, uh, of the government, and they formed a, a partnership, and they took all the uh, patterns that were in the, in the cellar of the mint and, and, and uh, inventory them, and so patterns became a new item for collecting. Farouk was also a collector of other things, and he developed his collection over time. What was the story when he finally got around to selling it? Why did he sell it? Well, he didn't sell it. The coins were taken away from him by the government, and he was told to leave the country. And the coins were sold in Cairo at Abdeen Palace. I think it was 54, 1954. Mm -hmm. And my former partner, Abe Kossoff, he went over there with his wife and daughter and a few other coin dealers that had some money at, at, at that time. There isn't, uh, at that time we all had a few dollars, but not like it has turned out to be today. It's, it's just too much. I can't fathom uh, spending uh, seven, eight hundred thousand dollars for a coin, but I, I guess they spend that for an automobile, so why not for a coin? Did you ever, in your early days of dealing in coins, believe that prices could reach the levels they are now? I never thought about it. I figured we'd just keep going the way it is now. And for a while we had a, a hiatus. It was quiet. But I always enjoyed when a collector, a true collector, came up to the office, you handed him a coin, he examined it for about a half hour, and he thanked you and went out. Whether he bought or not, that was it, it was enjoyable to talk to him because you, if if a, a man came up, he was a collector, say of large cents. He, he, I would ask him questions that I didn't know about certain coins, and I got an awful lot of information from the, the people who were specialists in certain varieties. How would you characterize coin collectors? Are they different than normal people? A true collector is different. He'll spend hours and hours looking at a certain coin to see if the, if, the, if the tail feathers are right or left, if the head is left, the head is right. There's uh, a chap that I knew in Mount Vernon was named Adolf Friedman. He was a friend of Abe Koslow's and mine. He specialized in, in $5 gold pieces. 
And he and there were so many varieties because no two coins were struck exactly the same. Mm -hmm. And he was a variety collector of five dollar gold pieces. So it, it depends on on your hobby, on what you want, how deep you want to go. And it's been interesting up to oh about ten years ago when things began to change, when this 64 and 65 came into being. And the grades. The grading, mean. and that created a lot of tension, and uh, uh, friendships were broken up, lawsuits were started. It, don't belong, it doesn't be belong in, in numismatics, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, the people in New York who were stacked, who were the largest, or one of the largest coin dealers in our country, have auction sales oh, 10, 12 times a year, and they, I have yet to find a coin being graded according to numbers. It just isn't fair to the person who is buying if they're not knowledgeable. You were involved with a collection of Mr. Beck that had quite a large holding of things. Yes, uh, John Beck from uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He had a couple of mines, and uh, he did very well. He was about five foot tall, a very sharp dresser. And he started to, uh, b to buy scarce coins, but he didn't realize it at that time. He, he, he just happened to pick out $50 gold pieces, uh, $3 gold pieces, Stella's $4 gold pieces, and when I came there, after he passed away, I was asked to come and inventory it and then ship it back to California to the bank and sell it. Uh, I had two guards around me, or three or four at a time sometime, and I opened up a box and there was 101 $50 gold pieces <laughs> called slugs. Uh, ma the majority of them were, were the octagonal. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, there were a few scarcer ones, the round ones. But he had a couple of hundred gold dollars, a few hundred, two and a half, all the way up the line. And, uh, and then he did have the coin that I call a flying eagle. It was made in 1856. Mm -hmm. And he collected those. He had over 500. According to our knowledge, they only struck about 525 or 550. But he, he had about 500 of them. So his, his hoarding became a true collector's paradise. And we sold that. It took two years to sell his collection. And uh, it was a well-known collection that still is. It's still referred to as, the, as a choice bit of, of, of conversation, the Beck collection. He also had a great deal to do with patterns in the pattern market. Yes, the patterns were uh, trial pieces that were struck before the coin was struck. Uh, a few artists were commissioned to present their ideas to Congress, uh, and, and they struck some coins in copper and uh, aluminum, etc., and gold. And Congress selected the w one coin to be published, to be struck, and the others were called patterns or trial pieces. And they were thrown in the cellar and cigar boxes or what have you. And uh, it became of interest to a few people. The first was, Ad, was Edgar Adams, who was a coin dealer, and, and uh, Wooden, who was Secretary of the Treasury, I believe, mm -hmm. at that time. And they, uh, as I have it, they gave the United States Mint a rare $50 gold piece, which the Mint collection didn't have in exchange for all the patterns, for all the junk in the cellar. And as I, as I heard, the first sale of these patterns was about a quarter of a million dollars. You bought a large pattern collection from a <coughs> Hollywood or t television producer? No, he, was a, he, he owned a station, a, uh, a network in New York. Uh, his name was Major Lohr, L-O-H-R. Mm -hmm. I think he was president of NBC or CBS. He, he gave up his presidency in the, in the company, go to Chicago, and become the curator of the Museum of Science and Industry. 
And uh, I heard that he had a collection of patterns which he was interested in selling. So I called him. He gave me the figure over the phone. And I said, they're mine. And I, I went out there, examined a few of them, and shipped them back here. And they were uh, a fantastic collection. I wish I had them again. What was the value of the collection? At that time, uh, I paid him $80,000. I would think today you probably get about $10 million $10 for the same collection, with a trunk full of beautiful patterns. You also handled the 1947 American Numismatic Association auction. Yes. What was it like at the well, convention we, then compared to the modern? Well, we days? all went up by train. Most of us did then. And uh, we had the convention at the, at the uh, what is that? it's not the Hilton. Uh, I can't it's think the of the hotel. chain. Anyway, we went up there, and, and the whole collection uh, of uh, people who were there, coin dealers and collectors, came outside in front of the, of the hotel, and we took a snapshot of them. And they totaled somewhere about 150 people. Today, you go to a coin convention, you get well, anywhere from 15,000 up. There's a great interest now in numismatics and coins, and, and I hope it, it continues. You were also friends with B. Max Mel, who I remember reading the comic books yes. where he would offer to buy yes, coins. Yes, that's right. He, he, was, uh, he, he started in Fort Worth, Texas, and he was, his friend was uh, uh, the, uh, the editor of the Fort Worth Start Telegram. Eamon Carter. Eamon Carter Sr. And he backed Max Mail, and when Max would buy a collection, uh, Carter would select a few coins for himself and then give the rest to Max. Max Mail uh, took an, a, a full-page ad in the uh, Post, Saturday Evening Post, for coins. And uh, he was the first one who really started advertising numismatics. And he became a, a renowned figure in the, and, and a friend of mine also. And how about Eamon Carter, his son, Eamon, Eamon Carter, Carter Jr.? Eamon Carter, the son, he was a collector. He, went out, he, he took his father's collection, and, and uh, he, he, he finished it. But he also, at the time his father died, they had in his office of the Fourth White Star Telegram, they had a pile of open newspapers, as you see each, and, and, and they saw green sticking out. There were complete sheets of uncut sheets of paper money in that whole file all the way down. So they took them out and put them where, where they were supposed to be. And Eamon Carter would, uh, he and I would go on a, a trip to a coin convention. He'd walk up to American Airline counter where, where which he was a, uh, a, a director and he would pull out a roll and open it up and there was a, a whole sheet of $1,000 bills. And he put it on the counter, I want to go with so and so. And he enjoyed that and he, he was a great uh, friend of all numismatists. And just very quickly because we're out of time, what would you say to a new collector today? How do you get started? Uh, write to the ANA and have them send you a list of dealers that they recommend in your area. Great. Mr. Kreisberg, thank you for having been with us. It's been a pleasure. Okay. My guest has been Abner Kreisberg. We thank you all for being with us. This has been David Lasso with A Coin Conversation. If you buy and sell coins, you should know about the Professional Numismatist Guild. This organization began in 1955 and now has more than 250 members nationwide who are experts in buying and selling rare coins and precious metals. The PNG is founded on the principles of knowledge, responsibility, and integrity in the rare coin business. PNG members have the highest personal, financial, and ethical standards in the coin industry. When you deal with a member of the Professional Numismatist Guild, you can expect to be treated fairly and to have the assurance of doing business with a recognized professional. Whether your interests are investing, collecting, or just learning more about rare coins, there's a PNG member near you. You can find out more about buying and selling rare coins by calling area code 818-781-1764 or write P.O. Box 430, Van Nuys, California, 91408. 
you'll receive a free brochure and the PNG directory listing 250 of the nation's top rare coin dealers. Call the PNG today. <laughs> 